Hello everybody, this is David Panush of the Edmund Burke School with the last and final video lecture on the book Stumbling on Happiness by Daniel Gilbert. Um, and we're excited to finish up and see what Daniel Gilbert has to show us. Um, Alright, so this is about the last chapter and uh, you can read the afterword if you'd like. It's nice, but uh, not necessarily required. Alright, so last chapter, Gilbert talked to us about the fact that we should learn from practice, that is our own experiences, but we don't for a variety of reasons. In this chapter, there should be another way to learn from our experiences that also doesn't work, and that is learning from coaching, that is learning from other people. If I'm going to make a mistake, wouldn't it work if somebody just said, hey, don't do that, or you should do this, or don't do this? The problem is, uh, there are two possibilities why we don't learn that well from coaching, and this is a gross generalization. There instances where we do learn very well from coaching, of course, but in terms of a lot of big decisions, we don't. And it's either we're getting bad advice and believing it, or we are getting good advice and rejecting it. And in fact, as Gilbert goes on to describe in the chapter, it is both. We are receiving advice that isn't actually very helpful, but we believe it is, so we follow it. That takes us to make a poor decision. And sometimes we are receiving very good advice, accurate advice that would be helpful if only we could follow it. And we can all think of examples where people tell us things we should do. We actually know it's the right thing to do and we don't do it. Um, and then there are things where people are telling us to do something, we do it, and it turns out that was a really bad advice. Um, so let's look into this a little bit more. When it comes to quote unquote what he calls bad advice or what I'm calling bad advice, um, there's this idea of false beliefs and there are false beliefs that can move through human society because they act like genes and they facilitate the own means of their transmission. That is, they promote their own copying. They promote a stable society so they get transmitted more often from person to person. Um, and uh, this is actually where the uh, beginning of the idea of memes, you know memes is uh, like a joke thing on the internet, but really it was the idea of an uh, uh, original idea of a meme by um, uh, Richard Dawkins in a book called The Selfish Gene, uh, which was like a, the end of the book, it wasn't even the main point of the book, but probably more people know about memes than the rest of his book, which is the idea. An, uh, it's a concept, an idea that replicates itself in human society. That's a meme, like a gene that replicates itself in biology. And there are two that, that Gilbert sort of hones in on. One is this false belief that replicates itself very well um, because it serves capitalist societies and stable and productive societies, which is you need more money and more stuff and more things in order, in order to be happy, in order to be well off. Um, and the studies on this seem to show pretty clearly that money that takes you out of extreme poverty is very helpful and definitely increases your happiness and sense of well-being. Um, but above a certain standard of living, it actually doesn't add that much more happiness to your life. And we can all think of and know lots of examples of very, very wealthy people who are not very happy. And in fact, lottery winners are, are often brought up as an, as an example. These are people who didn't have a lot necessarily, um, have a lot and often they are less happy uh, after they win the money. Again, you wouldn't think so, but it's true. So this keeps us working hard. Um, it keeps, it's good for society in some ways, but it's uh, not necessarily a true thing. So that's bad advice that we all tend to believe, uh, even though we know it's not good, ad good advice. Um, and there are, we can probably think of other myths like this that, that probably have outlived their usefulness, but we still follow them anyways. Um, so another big false belief is that having children will make you happy. And again, uh, maybe in the long run, and this is something we can discuss in class, in the long run, your memory of having children will be good. And maybe having them at the end of the day, uh, 30 years later when they're all grown up and have jobs and families of their own will be good. But the parenting of children is uh, empirically not good for your happiness. Um, so this could be one of those things like for short-term gain you want to have kids but uh, it, it is a long haul and in the long run you may be better off but 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 having a child in and of itself is not something that makes people happy. The data are pretty clear on that. But most people who tell us having kids is a great thing have already gone through it and so they 
uh, give us the advice that we should have kids too, and we believe them, and then we do. And of course, this is a great false belief because it leads to the reproduction of the species. So that does that's a good reason why this false belief persists. And it is definitely something that older people tend to push down onto younger people. And, and societies change, of course, and this belief may be maybe uh, not as um, prevalent as it used to be, certainly in our society, but it's still pretty darn prevalent. Um, okay, so what is the solution for all this uh, receiving bad advice and believing it? And, and, and that's one problem. So the problem is we should accept good advice. Let's, let's listen to the people who know uh, the right things to do. Um, and it turns out that they've studied this. It's the idea of surrogacy, which is pay attention to somebody who's having the experience you are about to have or you're deciding whether or not to have. And even if they are nothing like you at all, even if they are a complete stranger, okay, they don't have to be like you, their reporting of that experience is more accurate than your ability to imagine how you would like the experience. So that is a mind blower, so I'm gonna say it again. So let's say, I want to imagine what it's like to go to a certain college. And I use all my amazing faculties of imagination to do so. Now, then, and I predict, I write a prediction. This is what I think it'll be like to go to that college. Compare my prediction to an actual account of a student who's at that college right now, okay, to my actual experience. And then I go to the college. So I go to the college and I have my experience. My experience is much more likely to be exactly like the person who was experiencing it when I was making my decision than my imagination of it before I had it. And that's because of all the things that we've been talking about and Gilbert has spent his entire book talking about, which is we are very, very bad at imagining how things will be. Um, and we're very bad at using our powers of prediction. It is much more accurate to actually just ask somebody who's currently doing the experience and say, what's it like? Their experience at that moment is going to be closer to our experience if we go ahead and have the experience um, than our imagination. And so instead of trusting our imagination, we should listen to the advice of people who are doing it. That's the solution to everything. Um, and to some degree, you've seen, you know, in society, uh, reviews, and, and trusting uh, critics and people who tell us uh, about products and experiences. We, we do that TripAdvisor, Yelp, all those things. Like there's some of, that, some of that going on, although we do find it difficult to trust uh, those reviews. And by the way, the crazy thing about this is even if the person is nothing like you, a total stranger, it's still going to be better than your imagination. But we find it, you're probably struggling with this right now. And the reason you're struggling with this right now is this idea that Gilbert calls the uniqueness bias. Other psychologists call it by lots of other um, terms, but it's this basic idea that we know ourselves better than we can know anyone else. We are privy to all of our thoughts, all of our feelings. Um, we know our intentions. We know, we think we know what we like and what we like, uh, don't like and why. And because we know ourselves better than anyone else, uh, we think by virtue of our vast amount of information about ourselves as compared to our teeny tiny bit of information about others, that we must be special. It's just a, a sort of default, not that we're um, better or worse, just different than them, than anyone else over there. And millions of studies have been done on this. We all think we're better drivers than other people. We all think other people are, uh, are form their opinions uh, not based on logic and reasoning, whereas ours are super logical and reasonable reasonable and all kinds of other things. Um, so we overestimate our uniqueness and then we tend to believe that other people are not like us either. And in that case, if nobody else is like us and nobody else thinks exactly like us, and we know ourselves better than anyone else could possibly know us, shouldn't we trust our imagination over some stranger's experience or advice of the experience right now? So what that means is ultimately we are so unique, no one else could possibly know what we know about ourselves, so we reject surrogacy. So even though listening to others would be the way, would be the right way to go, if you really want to know how an experience is going to be, ask somebody who's experiencing it right now, and that is probably how you will experience it, more than likely. But instead, we reject that most of the time. We go with our own gut. We go with our own imagination. We only, and even if we do ask other people, we only ask people who are close to us, our friends and our trusted advisors, not that they're experiencing the thing. Even if they experienced it years ago, 
They're not experiencing it right now. They're not going to be as good predictors for us. Um, and in fact, they may have had their, their memories altered, as we well know, because uh, those false beliefs may persist. Should I have children? Oh, yes, I had children 20 years ago. It was wonderful. Um, so instead, ask the parent who's up all night with the puking uh, two-year-old whether or not you know, they enjoy, uh, at that moment, having uh, a two-year-old. Now, I don't want to be super cynical. Of course, I love my children, and I'm glad I had them. But here I am um, giving you, giving you. it's not the advice of whether or not to have children, but it is hard and not fun all the time. But I am looking forward to when they are all grown up and, and uh, well uh, um, and, and, and all those other good things. And I can look back fondly um, as a parent as well. So that's the gist of these last bits um, uh, of the book. It is important to listen to other people who are having the experience. It's our best bet to sort of escape the traps of our imagination. And uh, I hope you uh, try to take that advice when you can and, uh, and do well on your merry way. If you have any questions, uh, let me know.